на Мърси Сайд, Скептик Съсайти. И а, в следствие на неговата, на неговата или по-скоро на тяхната колективна, колективна битка, а, като резултат успяват да затворят голяма част от клиниките или по-скоро вече всички а, хомеопатични клиники в Обединеното кралство и да намалят значително публичното финансиране на а, хомеопатията в а, UK. А, и всъщност а, тази вечер ще погледнем историята на, на тази битка. А, преди да започнем, разбира се, а, насърчавам ви да задавате вашите въпроси към, а, на нашия портал Следо. Скоро би трябвало да излезе една една визия с код 1023, между другото, който познае в следващите 10 секунди, защо сме избрали код 1023, получава една бира от мен. Моля? Добре, печелиш. Ама ти, ти си от вътрешните хора. Ще видим дали ще получиш бира. Добре, а, предавам да започваме. Дами и господа, да посрещнем с аплодисменти Майкъл Маршал. Заповядай, Майкъл. Благодаря. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, for coming along this evening. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm from the UK, uh, so I was delighted to accept this uh, invitation to come and speak in Bulgaria uh, while I'm still allowed in. Uh, that might not be true for the next couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, I've been a, a, a skeptical activist now for about 10 years. Um, and so uh, I was one of the co-founders of the Merseyside Skeptic Society in 2009, and we were one of the first uh, skeptical organizations in the sort of the new wave of skepticism in the UK sort of about 10 years ago. And one of the, the reasons that uh, I co-founded the group was that myself and some of my, my co-founders had had very similar experiences in our past that I dare say some of you will have had in your pasts as well, where you might be uh, out for a drink with your friends and family and having a really lovely time, having a really nice evening, and then you very casually mention that you think astrology is a load of bullshit, and then this silence descends upon the room, and you realize your family are really into astrology, and that's how you found it out, by stepping on this big conversational landmine. Uh, and so when we started the Skeptic Society, we wanted a space where people could come where there weren't any of those potential conversational landmines, where if you were to express views that were aligned with critical thinking and uh, question superstition, question received wisdom, uh, it would be a place that, uh, that would be very welcome. Um, But we've always, and so for 10 years, we've been putting on uh, events in, uh, in Liverpool, um, and those events are uh, aimed at building a community, you know, so you can have a room full of people who might not agree with some of the, the mainstream things they see in society or in mainstream religion and things. They can come to a certain room and sort of disagree together, and that's quite a useful thing. Um, but we always set up as well as an activist organization. We wanted to look out there at the, the pseudoscience in the world around us. What superstition is out there? What alternative medicine is out there? What strange experiences are out there? And what can we do about it? And that's the mentality we've always had for the last 10 years. And so I took that, uh, that mentality and I've had all manner of things done to me. I've been to mind, body, spirit festivals where I've been poked and prodded and adjusted and fed bizarre little glasses filled with liquid that I should never drink and I should learn not to drink, but I always drink it and I'm never going to learn not to drink it. Um, and I've had my palm read and all sorts of things as well. Uh, and having done some of that work as a, a, a volunteer skeptical activist for five years, uh, in 2014, I was offered the chance to become a full-time skeptical activist. I now work for a charity called the Good Thinking Society, which is uh, founded by Simon Singh, who's quite a well-known science writer. Some of you may have read some of his books. Uh, and now it's, it's my full-time job to be a, a skeptical activist, to uh, investigate things, to go undercover occasionally and investigate things, uh, to campaign against them, to uh, talk to the media, talk to... Uh, regulatory bodies to talk to the police sometimes to try and stop people being uh, sold ideas that don't work uh, and to try and make it very difficult for people to fool people and to con people. And then another part of my job is to travel around the country and occasionally around the world like this, uh, encouraging people to, to, to look into these kind of things, to have a passion for skepticism, to, to be interested in exploring the world around us and the weirdness of the world around us. So it's literally part of my full-time job to go to rooms full of complete strangers and encourage them to doubt things. Uh, and whenever I tell people that that's my job, there's always someone looks at me as if to say, that's not really a job. Um, and to those people, I would say, that's how good I am at making you doubt things, that you even doubt my career and how valid my career is. Um, 
So one of the first big skeptical activist campaigns I got involved with uh, was about homeopathy in the UK. So what we found was by reading the newspapers and by talking to people, we found most people in the UK didn't really know what homeopathy was. Most people would say, oh, homeopathy is herbal medicine, it's natural medicine. They wouldn't know how homeopathy is made, that you take a substance and you dilute it and dilute it and dilute it and dilute it, and the more times you dilute it, the stronger it is, and that's the pill that you give to people. The pills that you give to people when you give them homeopathy contain nothing at all but sugar and water. And people had no idea about this in the UK. And so we thought, how do we advertise that fact? How can we do a publicity stunt that advertises the fact that homeopathic pills are just sugar pills and nothing more than that? So what we thought was, if we could get people to go into their local pharmacy in the UK and buy some homeopathic sleeping pills, and then all together stand outside of that pharmacy and take an overdose of those homeopathic sleeping pills, we could demonstrate that nobody falls asleep and nobody falls ill in any way. People are absolutely fine because these things are just sugar pills. And we came up with this campaign called the 1023 campaign. And the name of the campaign actually was very specific because we found that whenever the media talked about homeopathy, they would say things like homeopathic remedies are very dilute. They're ultra dilute. There's barely anything in it. But they wouldn't say there's nothing in it. And we wanted to try and force the media to tell the truth about homeopathy, to crowbar the truth into the reporting. So we thought, how do we do this? Well, there's a principle in chemistry, the Avogadro limit. Broadly speaking, it's the more that you dilute something, eventually you're going to hit a point where you can't find the initial thing you diluted. It's so dilute, so much water, you're not going to find a single molecule of your initial substance. And that is the Avogadro limit. And that Avogadro limit is 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23. So we thought, what if we do our overdose at exactly 10.23 in the morning, which is a weird time to be doing something, so that must mean something. And what if we call our campaign the 10.23 campaign, then whenever the newspapers write about it, they have to explain what that number means. And so when we did it, it made every single newspaper in the UK, it was a front page of the BBC News for the day, and every single one of those reports included a line that said, the campaign group takes its name after the chemical principle that demonstrates there is nothing in homeopathy. So we could crowbar the real science in by thinking strategically about how we present what we're doing. And that's a big part of what I try and do with my skeptical activism, is try and figure out how we can present real science in a way that's a bit interesting and a bit effective, really. And so uh, in 2010, we had, uh, I think it was 300 people in 13 cities across the UK, all taking this overdose at 10.23 in the morning. And it did make quite a splash in terms of the news. And if you watch the news coverage after this event, it changed the way people talk about homeopathy in the news. People started saying that homeopathic remedies have nothing in them. And it did actually start to influence the media's portrayal of homeopathy, which was quite useful. Um, but that was 2010, and we thought, well, that's only the UK. Obviously, there are skeptics all around the world. There are skeptical activists all around the world and skeptical groups. And there's homeopathy in pretty much everywhere in the world. So how big can we make this idea of this collective group mass suicide or mass overdose on homeopathy? So I spent uh, about three, four months talking to every single skeptic I could find in the world. I flew to Budapest to meet at the European Skeptics uh, annual meeting and talk to all sorts of skeptical groups there. And after spending a long time trying to do that, the 2011 1023 campaign looked like this. Every one of those blue dots is another homeopathic overdose happening at exactly 10.23 in the morning local time. 1,700 people in 70 cities in 32 countries across seven continents, including Antarctica. We had a research scientist in Antarctica taking a homeopathic overdose in front of a massive, uh, kind, of, uh, massive kind of ice background. It was really, really cool. Um, and the idea of this was to show that there is an international skeptics community, and we care about this stuff, and we're willing to do something about this stuff. We're willing to join together. But also the idea was every one of those overdoses was quite small. It was a small little thing. But the fact we were all doing it together had a real impact. It was the, 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 the demonstration of the power of what we can have together. And as one illustration of uh, the effect of 1023, I spoke to the Polish skeptics, and they told me that after 1023, you can watch the sales of homeopathy drop by 17% in the months following 1023, because they just demonstrated and advertised what homeopathy was, and were reaching people who might never have really thought about what it was, and maybe thought, well, this is natural, this is herbal. By demonstrating what it was, it, can, it helped people understand why it wouldn't actually be possible. 
The other picture I'll point out is this one here. This is a statue in Zaragoza University. So th this is a statue of Samuel Hahnemann, the inventor of homeopathy. And on the day of the campaign, these Spanish skeptics adorned him with a 1023 t-shirt and hat to make him get in the spirit of our campaign. Um, so that was something that I was doing as a, a volunteer skeptic. This is things that I was doing while I was keeping a full-time job and sort of having a, uh, as best as I could a real life uh, whilst doing these things. Um, but since I've become a, a full-time skeptic, we try and be quite strategic about the targets that we take on to see where can we make an effect? How can we actually have an effect if we're doing this all the time? If, I, if my full-time, nine to five, every single day of the week is, is trying to affect skeptical activism. And the way that we, and this is the team, by the way, there's myself, there's Simon Singh, who's my boss, and there's my colleague, Laura, who works part-time with us. Um, and when we try and choose the type of targets we go for, there are a few criteria that we try and look at to understand what's worth us trying to do. So the first is we look for something where there is incontrovertible evidence of harm. Where could someone be harmed by this? Where is the potential for harm? You know, where is this idea actively going to cause people distress or uh, loss of funds, loss of time, if it's their health, loss of health? So we, that's one of the areas we look at. But we also to see, look to see where there's not many people already working on it. So there's no point us putting the time that we have to something if there's an entire organization dedicated to that idea. We'll look elsewhere and spend our time elsewhere to see if we can have a better effect there. We look for settled science, because there's no point us looking at edge cases where it's not really clear one way or the other. We, there's a lot of stuff that we know for sure definitely doesn't work, so how can we try and tackle that? And that's one thing we look at. And we also think, what can we actually achievably do? Is there something we can actually see, a tangible outcome, an effect we can have on the world? And if we can see that, and we see all, something, if, if an idea ticks all of these boxes, that's how we go about uh, trying to, to change the world around us and being a skeptical uh, organization. That's the space that we operate in, that middle space there. And so when I talk about this, I, this is a talk that, I, that I, I tend to sort of refer to as kind of tackling pseudoscience in the UK establishment. And by UK establishment, what I mean is that the bodies of government and the bodies of regulation and the established bodies in the UK, the established organizations within the UK, so in the UK, we have uh, the National Health Service, you know, uh, the, uh, that, uh, a state medicine that's free for everybody to use, one of the most remarkable things uh, our country has ever done for its citizens and something that I really hope continues in the, the weeks and months ahead, uh, even if that's not necessarily certain. Um, but where we know that the National Health Service is spending money on things that don't work, we know that there are mechanisms we could work with to try and stop that. There's bodies like advertising standards and trading standards that are there to try and stop consumers from being lied to in adverts or being fooled by, by traders. So we know we could work with those. There are bodies like uh, the, the, the regulatory body of vets and doctors and dentists who make sure that those healthcare professionals aren't making claims they shouldn't be making and aren't acting in ways they shouldn't be. And then there's similar bodies for pseudoscience. So there's osteopathic council, the chiropractic council, the society of homeopaths. They have rules and regulations of how they make sure people aren't misleading the public. So there are all these different bodies that, that exist within the UK that we knew we could try and tap into and understand how do they stop people from misleading people? How do they stop uh, untrue claims from pro propagating and confusing people? And so the, where we started off was with the NHS. And there was a strange thing with the, the, the National Health Service in the UK, even though this is taxpayer funded, uh, the National Health Service in the UK uh, has been uh, for a long time funding homeopathy, spending taxpayer money on remedies that are nothing but sugar and water, um, which to us is obviously something of a scandal. If you're going to spend a very limited pool of resources, which is what taxpayer funds always are, you don't spend it on stuff that we know categorically doesn't work. There are much better places to spend that. And the reason the NHS was funding homeopathy is that when the NHS was invented in 1948, the committee to put the NHS together included a homeopath. And so obviously the homeopath is going to say, you want some homeopathy on there, obviously you're going to pay for homeopathy. So we looked, how do we try and stop this? Because it's been known for a long time that the NHS was spending money in homeopathy, but nobody had really had much success doing anything about it. So we thought, right, let's really get to grips with what's going on here. How does the NHS fund anything? Well, in the UK, the way our health system is set up is all of the funding decisions aren't made by central government. They're made by every single region around the country and 300 regions across England and some more regions in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So there's nobody in central government whose job it was to even ask, are we spending money on homeopathy? And if so, how much? Nobody in the government had any clue how much we were spending on homeopathy. 
So the first task we had was to ask every single body in the UK, every single health body in the UK, are you spending money on homeopathy? And if so, tell us how much and where you're getting it from. And that was the first task that I had. Uh, and uh, we published the results uh, shortly afterwards. There we go. I've gone too far, sorry. Okay, we'll just live with this. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Typical, there we are. There we are. Uh, so uh, what we found was, even though we talked about homeopathy being funded on the NHS, actually the, major the majority of the NHS didn't fund homeopathy. Most places already said, we don't do it, we have no plans to do it, it's not useful for us. There was only 31 places in the UK that spent any money on it at all. There was 14 who said, yes, we spend money on it. And there were 17 who said, we don't know whether we do or don't. There is no way for us to know about that. Um, so I thought, well, if there's these 31, like 10% of the country, is there something about these 31 that makes them interesting, that we can use to start to, to work against this? And so I thought I'd colour in a map to illustrate where the funding is. So all the white places don't fund homeopathy, and you can see that the red places and the orange places do. And so it's pretty clear that it's all clustered, it was all clustered together when we started looking into it around Liverpool, Bristol, and London, apart from this very small little bit of spending up here in Newcastle. I thought this was quite strange because I grew up in Newcastle and I moved to Liverpool and I thought, is it me? Am I the reason that uh, homeopathy is being funded? But it's not because I've never lived in Bristol, so we're fine. Uh, but the real reason is there was a homeopathic hospital in Liverpool and one in Bristol and one in London. And the, one in the, the space in Newcastle was a very small amount of money that was uh, on its way out and was a, a strange case. So it was clear to us that if you're near one of those homeopathic hospitals in the UK, you could get homeopathy on the NHS, but if you weren't, you couldn't. So this gives us something to try and, uh, try and work with. And in looking into uh, how homeopathy was funded, strange stories started to emerge. And one of the strangest stories was who was actually selling the homeopathic remedies. So the NHS must be buying these pills somewhere. So I looked into the pharmacies that were selling the NHS all these pills, and it was one pharmacy was supplying to Liverpool and Bristol and to Glasgow. And it was a pharmacy called Freeman's Homeopathic Pharmacy, which is based up in Scotland. So I thought, wait, well, these are someone who are making more than £100,000 a year from the taxpayer. And several different parts of the UK government has approved these as suppliers. So surely, these are very legitimate. These are very honest. These are very modern. These are uh, uh, the most modern homeopathic kind of, com uh, kind of company you can imagine. So I had a look at their website to see uh, what homeopathy they sell. They sell 3,400 different homeopathic remedies. It's one of my favorite lists I've ever seen. Uh, they sell homeopathic albatross, homeopathic al alligator, homeopathic baboon. They sell homeopathic brain and colon and eye. They, say, they sell a homeopathic preparation of human semen. So if you want that, I know where I can get you some of that. Uh, they sell homeopathic rainbow. But they also sell homeopathic full color spectrum. Now, I don't know how much of a distinction they make between a rainbow and a full color spectrum. Whether you get like infrared and UV in there, I don't know. These questions aren't asked. Um, but they also sold individual homeopathic colors. You could buy the color green, a homeopathic green. And I thought, well, why would I buy a homeopathic green and a homeopathic orange when I could buy a homeopathic rainbow and get a green and orange in it, like a multivitamin? Are you trying to rip me off by selling me these separately? Um, they sold homeopathic carpet, which I thought was a fun one because carpet is material that's on the ground. But it could be like synthetic, it could be polyester, it could be wool, it could be cotton. There's lots of different materials it could be made of. But if it's on the ground, it's a carpet. If it's hanging off a window, that's a curtain. But they didn't care what it was made of. If it's on the floor, they'll have it. They had homeopathic fire. I don't want to be the guy who has to dilute fire for a living. That sounds like a very disappointing job description to be making homeopathic fire. Uh, they had homeopathic Lourdes water, you know, Lourdes, the, uh, the, the, the pilgrimage site in France that's meant to be blessed by God and therefore have the power to cure all disease. Well, sometimes, presumably, you must need something more powerful than blessed by God because they had a homeopathic, extra powerful version of that on sale at this, uh, this homeopathic pharmacy. But I looked at this list and thought, surely this isn't what they actually sell. This is stuff they used to sell. It's a very old pharmacy. This is the list of things they've ever sold. But these are suppliers to the National Health Service. They aren't going to be mucking around with homeopathic baboons and homeopathic fire. So I thought there's only one way to find that out, and that's to phone them up and try and order some weird homeopathy. And uh, because of the type of person I am, I obviously recorded that phone call, and I'm going to play it for you now. So do you actually make all the, the remedies that are on, on your site there? Yes, uh-huh. 
Ah, okay, okay, that's that's good to know. Because uh, I must admit, that I was trying to find something, and I was having a good look around your site, and I was surprised by some of the things that are on there. It was things like, I mean, I, I was looking at the, the pollen, and there, there was stuff on there from like owls. You make an owl uh-huh. remedy? How how do you? I don't know how you go about making a a remedy from an owl, really. Well, oh. the, the, by the feathers. Ra- oh, that, yeah, that, yes, that makes sense. And is that for so, like people who are allergic to owls? Well, it can, the thing is, with um, it's not like it's much that they're actually, um, you know, allergic to owls. They could have the characteristics of one, you know, where you know they kind of uh, they don't sleep, and you know they can pick. Some people can actually pick up characteristics of animals. Oh right, okay. Um, so that you know, some homeopathic doctors like to treat that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, it's. The kind of I get into kind of like all like animals and you know kind of things like that. We don't give them out over just over the counter. Mm. That's actually doctors and practitioners. You know that's that's for you know like them to prescribe. Right. Okay. Oh, that's that's really good to know then. Um, all right, I'll give that a try. Thank you so much. Okay for your help. then. Really bye bye. Bye. So this was a strange conversation to have with anyone, let alone someone who is a supplier to the National Health Service who makes a hundred thousand pounds a year of taxpayer money and is selling this stuff to treat genuinely sick people in the UK with the seal of approval of the UK government. But at least she said she wouldn't sell me it because she said you need a, a prescription from a doctor or practitioner. And that's true because under EU law, uh, you, are, you have some remedies that have a license to be sold and you can sell them over the counter. But if it doesn't have a license, you can't sell them to people just over the internet or over the counter. You have to have a doctor write you a prescription uh, and that wasn't the case this time. But I thought, they're still willing to sell these things. Do they really stick by the law? So a week later, I phoned them up, and a week later, I bought my homeopathic owl. Uh, it came through the post. There is my homeopathic owl. Um, I used to take my homeopathic owl with me when I give talks, and I'd hand them out to the audience to have a look at it, but someone let the lid off, and it flew away. So I can't do that anymore, unfortunately. So uh, that's uh, the only shame. Um, but this should have been quite a scandal, because... It was illegal to sell me this remedy. This was a supplier to the National Health Service breaking the law by selling me this. And this is something that's come up time and again in the stuff we've been looking at, is homeopathic uh, remedies in the UK are routinely sold illegally. And so one of the things we've been doing is working with the, the, the body that regulates that, that upholds that law to stamp down on this, to make sure that when uh, a remedy needs to be prescribed by a doctor, at the very least, you don't just sell them it over the, over the counter or over the internet. You do actually uh, have them take a prescription for it. So we're actually making some headway and pushing back on that. Um, So in terms of how much money was being spent on homeopathy in the UK, these are my findings. We found about £5.3 million a year across the the UK in total. London was a bit of an estimate because London said they didn't keep track of how much they spent. They just give people homeopathy and didn't write down what they were giving them, which is a ridiculous position for a hospital to be in. Um, So there we are. We published these figures. We said £5 million a year. We've got the answer. We know how much is being funded. But we didn't stop there, because it's not enough to just have the answer. Once you have the answer, you can start seeing what you can do about it. And this is where we started to be more active and actually push back. And so what we looked at was every one of those places that funded homeopathy had to sign a contract with a homeopathy supplier to spend taxpayer money. And whenever they signed that contract, because they were spending taxpayer money, that contract was uh, available, available to be challenged by the public if they thought that was not a legal use of the money. And if you are spending money on something you've already admitted doesn't work, that shouldn't be a legal use of the money. And so in 2014, my hometown where I live currently, Liverpool, uh, they agreed to carry on funding homeopathy. Uh, Sorry, in 2014, they they did a review to see whether they should fund homeopathy. And in December, even though nobody said you should and all the evidence said you shouldn't, in December they decided they'd fund it anyway. So it was December 2014. In uh, February 2015, we threatened to sue the government over this and said, you can't spend money this way because it's not a legal use of money. You're going against all of the evidence. And we said, we'll take you to court because we're pretty happy about this. We're pretty confident we're right about this. Uh, And in April 2015, Liverpool agreed that they'd made a mistake with the decision and they backed down and they said, we'll make another decision. We'll have another consultation. Now, this was useful because it meant they would have to ask the public, do you think we should fund homeopathy or not? 
And whenever that normally happens, and I'm sure it's very similar uh, all around the world, when a government is asking a question like that, most people who hear about it are the ones who really care a lot about making sure homeopathy thrives. It's homeopaths, it's patients who use homeopathy, it's people who've got money in the game or who care about it an awful lot because they really believe in homeopathy. And so they, they would normally flood these consultations with reasons why homeopathy has to be available on the NHS. But we knew about this consultation now, and because we now existed as a body, the Good Thinking Society, we could write to people who cared about this who might not know about it and have them offer their thoughts, have them put in their, uh, their own expertise, their own, uh, their own uh, appraisals of the evidence. And that's what we did. We worked with local skeptics in Liverpool to, to write to this consultation and say there are better uses of this money. And as a result, uh, in June 2016, a new decision was made, and they stopped funding homeopathy in Liverpool. So we'd actually managed to... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we actually had a tangible effect. But the useful thing about this was, it wasn't just about stopping it in Liverpool. It was demonstrating to all the other places that we're actually willing to challenge these decisions. They've had plenty of time where they would just push these decisions through because they were worried that they might get uh, sued by homeopaths or get complaints from homeopaths if they didn't. But now he said, we are willing to take these things to court because we really strongly believe in it. And as a result, the world, which is over the water from Liverpool, they stopped funding homeopathy in October 2016. And in March 2018, London stopped funding homeopathy. The NHS told London, you cannot spend any more money on homeopathy. Even though they had the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital, it was no longer allowed to give any patients homeopathy. Uh, I have no idea what it is going to carry on doing, but it's not going to be doing the sugar pill thing. Um, and so as a result, actually this is slightly, uh, slightly not uh, up to date, but as a result, all of those places that were funding homeopathy no longer fund homeopathy. Uh, all of London stopped. The homeopathic hospitals in Liverpool, Bristol, they've both closed. Glasgow Hospital is the one that's left, and we're now working to try and stop it in, uh, in Glasgow. So we actually have managed to take that £5 million a year figure and reduce it down to £100,000, £200,000, and we're working on getting it even lower. And that means all that money can go to stuff that actually works. So we're actually having a tangible benefit, I think. Um, but there's another way of doing it, and it's that way of getting homeopathic out by getting a doctor to write you a prescription. So how do we tackle that, we thought? Well, we looked at the laws, and again, it's an EU law uh, around the, the, the licensing of drugs, and there is a list of uh, drugs that you are not allowed to prescribe. They're on a banned list. And one of the reasons that they might, some of the reasons they might be on the banned list is if it's a very expensive drug that there's not good evidence for, or if it's no better than a very cheap version of the drug, or if it's uh, just not cost effective. So if you had a common cold and that might last for a fortnight, if you took a drug that would take two days off the common cold, but it cost thousands of pounds, it wouldn't be worth doing it. You just have people sneeze for an extra two days. So these are some of the reasons that drugs get banned on the National Health Service from prescription. And so we looked at this list and said, by every single one of these criteria, homeopathy should be banned. It's not cost effective, it doesn't work, it's not better than an alternative because there's no efficacy. So you have to ban this. And we wrote to the Department of Health and said, you've got to ban this. They said initially, we've got no plans to do that. Um, so we said to them, well, it's literally your legal job to do that, and we will take you to court over this. We are willing to sue the Department of Health and the government if they don't actually put this on the banned list, because we're pretty confident in our reading of the law. And that was June 2015. Uh, September 2015, the Department of Health backed down, and what they said was, we're going to have a consultation, we're going to ask the public whether we should ban this or not. And that consultation was going to take place in uh, November, um, and so, uh, well, they agreed they'd have the consultation around November. In June 2016, that consultation was due to start. Unfortunately, June 2016 might stick in your mind as a date that something else happened in the UK that slightly changed the timeline on what we were looking at uh, because Brexit happened and everything stopped. And so uh, throughout all of the last couple of years, not a huge amount happened for a couple of years uh, while the government tried to figure out what we do about the Brexit situation, uh, which is very much where the government still is in the UK. Um, but in, 20, in October 2017, they did have that review about whether they should uh, prescribe it or not. And in November, they advised all doctors not to prescribe it. And so that's almost as good as what we're after, but there are some doctors who are also homeopaths, and we want to make sure they aren't allowed to say, well, I'm just going to ignore the advice and prescribe it anyway. And so we're pushing to have them actually do that. As it happens, the, the homeopathic lobby in the UK took the government to court over that decision and said, you can't do this to us. This is an illegal decision. But actually, their case was thrown out completely because the decision was made very well. So we tried to stick to the law and read the law as closely as possible and work to support the government in making the right decision. And it sticks when you do it, uh, when you do it properly. 
So we're now in a position where we're waiting for uh, the government to sign off on banning homeopathy, and then we should be in a place where it's banned from prescription. And it's from several different things that we've been doing, as I say, over the last couple of years. So that's one of the areas we've been working on when it comes to homeopathy in the UK. There's another case we're actually currently bringing, but first I'll show you while we've been doing all that work, we haven't been doing it in a vacuum. We haven't been doing it behind the scenes or in silence. We've worked as closely as possible with as many media organizations as possible throughout the entire time. It's just some of the coverage of just that homeopathy campaign uh, regularly over, over the course of every other week there'd be stories in the newspapers. And the reason for this, getting stories right across the breadth of the UK media, is because we can use this case to demonstrate and remind people that there's no evidence that homeopathy works, that homeopathy is not an effective treatment, that you shouldn't be spending money on it. So by getting these headlines for the, the legal cases and the, and the campaign work we've been doing, we can use those headlines to increase public awareness. And I think we're at a place now for, for various reasons, some of which being the work we've been doing, that most people in the UK, I think, recognize that homeopathy is not an effective treatment. There's a minority of people who really do believe it, but those middle ground people, there's fewer and fewer people who confuse homeopathy for herbal medicine or natural medicine. People now typically will know what it is, and partly it's to do with headlines like the ones we've been getting. We've got another big thing we're doing with homeopaths in the UK at the moment. Um, so you get some homeopaths in the UK who are doing CEASE therapy, C-E-A-S-E -E therapy. It stands for Complete Eradication of Autistic Spectrum Exhibition, I think it stands for. And it's an autism cure. They claim it's an autism cure. It's actually homeopathy and vitamins and supplements and various other things. But they say that vaccines are toxic, vaccines cause autism, but homeopathy can cure autism, and that's what cease therapy is. Now, obviously, there is no evidence that's the case, and it's hugely harmful to autistic children who they're targeting and the parents of autistic children to make these kind of claims and to, to, to sow the seeds of doubt in vaccines in that kind of way. But in the UK, you've got a regulator whose job is to make sure homeopaths aren't making claims they can't back up. That's the Society of Homeopaths. And the Society of Homeopaths have done nothing really to stop their, their members making these claims about being able to cure autism. But in the UK, if you're a healthcare regulator, you're regulated by the government. There's a body called the, the Professional Standards Authority who regulate all of the healthcare authorities. So they regulate the homeopaths, but they also regulate doctors and dentists and vets. And so we are actually saying to the Professional Standards Authority, if the Society of Homeopaths won't stop their members making these dangerous claims about autism, you need to kick them off your register so they no longer get to say, we are government approved. The PSA, the Professional Standards Authority, said we're not going to do that. So we're currently taking the government to court again uh, to say either kick these people off the register or actually regulate them and make sure they're not allowing their members to put autistic children in harm's way. That's a case that's currently ongoing. We're going to hear in the next week or two uh, whether that's going to go to court and actually be heard by a judge or whether the government backs down on it. But we're committed to this because we think we've got the reading of the law right, and certainly we think we're on the right side of this. So that's one of the big campaigns we're currently in the middle of. On the, still on the subject of homeopathy, we've done a lot of work when it comes to veterinary homeopathy. So there are a lot of uh, coverage in the UK, there was a couple of years ago, of vets who use homeopathy to treat animals. And so the BBC even would endorse this. They'd have entire articles and radio shows pointing out how wonderful it is, this homeopath who's doing this amazing stuff on a farm. And you have the, the, the uh, Homeopathy Association, the British sort of uh, lobby for, for homeopaths. They say, well, homeopathy must be effective for people because it's effective for animals. Here's all this proof of how many vets use it for animals. So the fact that animals are be being put in harm's way is one thing, but also people are using this to justify why people should take homeopathy. So we thought, what can we do about this? Well, we came across a vet who'd actually started a petition to try and ban homeopathy being used by his fellow professionals. So out of 22,000 vets in the UK, 50 of them are homeopaths, which is not very much, but the, but the UK isn't very big. So if those 50 are spread relatively well across the country, you're never more than an hour's drive from a, home from a, a vet who's willing to give your animal homeopathy. And so they have quite a lot of reach in that kind of way. Um, and obviously this harms animals, because animals can't say, actually I'm in a lot of pain and the sugar pills you gave me didn't help. So they are just suffering for no reason, which is kind of a, a, an important reason why we're doing it. But it also reflects very badly on, on vets as a whole. It undermines public trust in vets. If people who know homeopathy is nonsense see vets giving homeopathy, they might trust vets a little bit less as well. So there's lots of reasons why this is a very, very bad thing. Um, 
So we found this vet, a chap called uh, Danny Chambers, who'd written this petition to say he wanted to get as many people and as many vets as possible to sign this to say we should ban the use of homeopathy for animals. So we thought, how do we use our, uh, our resources? How do we use our understanding of campaigning to try and amplify this message as much as possible? Try and get this in front of as many people as possible and try and help this guy get as many signatures as possible. Well, we, we, had, we helped Danny write pieces for, the, for the, the, the national media explaining why it's so important that uh, homeopaths aren't allowed to treat animals. We had other pieces that we had him uh, put in, in various of the newspapers and we got coverage ourselves. We had him on TV talking about it. We wrote to every veterinary surgeon uh, in the UK to say this is a really important thing. We think you should support it. And we tried to raise as much profile as possible. This is just, again, some of the coverage there he is on the BBC talking about, uh, about this campaign. And the effect of this was actually quite significant. So, first of all, he got more than 1,000 vets to sign this petition, which is, there's 22,000 vets in the UK, more than 1,000 vets signed it, and he gave that petition to the veterinary regulator, the veterinary body, to say, this is a really serious thing, and actually, we should be taking this seriously. It's not about sugar pills and placebos. There's a really serious element here of animals being harmed. And as a result of that, first of all, he was elected to the Council of uh, Policy for the, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. So it's now partly his job to help determine what vets are and aren't allowed to do, which was a useful thing that he got elected on there based on this petition, based on the work he was doing. It's also the first time in a long time that there isn't a homeopath on that council deciding what vets are and aren't allowed to do. He replaced a homeopath on there, so we're bringing more evidence basis to veterinary care in the UK. And as a result of him being on the council and as a result of the, the petition that he put, uh, he put together, we had coverage in the press pointing out how vets are saying we need to stop homeopathy is just a trick of the mind. And actually, as a result, the veterinary council said, you are no longer allowed to. We no longer would back up any vet who gives an animal homeopathy without giving them real treatment. If you do that, you're going to face serious repercussions. So we're actually able to find people who are doing good work and am amplify that using the campaigning and, uh, and the resources and the, the skills that we have. Then we've got a major issue in the UK with charities. There are hundreds of thousands of charities in the UK, 200, more than 200,000 charities in the UK. And if you're a charity, people assume you must be doing something good. You must be a good organization who's trying to improve the world around us. That's what charity law says. You've got to be trying to improve the world around you. You've got to be in the public benefit. And as a result, you get tax benefits, but also you get credibility. People think a charity is, is a, an important thing. But yet, there were charities in the UK who existed solely for the promotion of pseudoscience. There was a charity in the UK who, who existed specifically to give homeopathy to AIDS victims in Botswana. There is no public good in that. There is a lot of public harm. There were charities that existed specifically to spread misinformation about the safety of vaccines. Even while the government was saying, we've got a measles epidemic, we need to vaccinate kids, they were allowing a charity to say, measles is fine, vaccines are really evil and dangerous. So the, the, the fact that these charities were out there undermines the public trust in charities in general. So thought, what could we do about this? Well, there's a regulator called the Charities Commission who regulate all charities. They make sure that as a charity, you're not doing things you shouldn't be doing. As it happens, we're a charity. These are our regulators. So one of the things we did was we threatened to sue our own regulators to say, you need to actually be better at regulating charities. You need to come down harder on charities and make sure you're upkeeping the charity law. Um, that was a very strange day in, uh, in our, uh, our office where we decided it would be a good idea to sue our own regulators. Um, so we, uh, we also had uh, a letter signed in a, local newspaper, in, a, in a national newspaper, rather, signed by 11 healthcare professionals, senior professors, saying it's really dangerous that these charities are allowed to do that. And we got publicity off the back of that to publicize what we were doing to make sure it was very clear that this was an issue. So in September, we said if you don't act. If you don't regulate these charities, we will take you to court. They said, okay, fine, we're going to act. We're going to have a full review. Don't take us to court. They backed down immediately and said, we're going to have a full review in September 2016. And they had that in March 2017. And again, because it's a public consultation, we're able to talk to members of the public, to write to bodies who might not otherwise have known about this, to say, why don't you share your thoughts about this? Do you think charities should be allowed to promote anti-vaccine information, or do you think that's dangerous? We wrote to uh, doctors around the UK. We wrote to uh, academics in relevant fields at universities around the UK to say, if you care about this, take five minutes to write to this, uh, this consultation and share your thoughts, to raise awareness that, with people who wouldn't otherwise have seen it, to try and make sure that this got out there and reach people. 
And we also submitted our own thoughts about this. We wrote our own piece explaining why it's really dangerous that charities shouldn't be allowed, as they currently are, to promote pseudoscience, to promote dangerous health misinformation. Uh, and we got media coverage off the back of that. Uh, and it, uh, as a result, in December 2018, they announced new policies that would tighten things up so it was much, much harder for charities to continue doing that. Which is great that they've got these new policies, but the important thing is what they're doing with them. You can have a new policy, but if you're ignoring it or you're not really holding it up, it's not going to help a huge amount. So the next stage, and it's the stage we're currently at, is we're currently making complaints about more charities to say, you've done that whole consultation, you've done all that checking, here's a complaint about someone who's making some very dangerous claims. Are you going to do anything this time? If they refuse to do anything, they could face the legal action that they backed down from orig originally. That's what, where we're going to go sort of next, really. The last few things I'll talk about, there's a big issue with chiropractors in the UK. So again, a lot of people in the public don't really know what a chiropractor is. They assume they're back specialists. They don't realize that the entire history of chiropractic as a form of treatment is based on uh, ideas that are not at all scientific. It's based on the idea that your spine has an innate flow of energy and that all disease is caused by blockages in that energy. And therefore, when you twist people's spines, you're unleashing that energy and allowing it to flow better. There is no evidence that this is the case. The guy who invented chiropractic believed he was able to do it because he had a, a, a janitor who worked with him who was deaf, and he adjusted the guy's back and said that the janitor was able to hear again. And that's why he thinks the back is the secret of all health. But we've got thousands of chiropractors in the UK, and we know they make claims that are not substantiated. In fact, my boss, Simon Singh, when he wrote about this for his book, Trick or Treatment, was sued by the British Chiropractic Association for saying their claims are bogus, that they don't hold water. Now, as it happens, he won that case. He, he, he was thrown out. He didn't have a case to, to answer because he was on the right side of that. But we know there are chiropractors out there claiming to treat all sorts of things. So what do we do about that? Well, chiropractors have this general chiropractor council, a regulator, a body that's there to make sure they're not making misleading claims. And so we thought, first of all, what if we look at the 100 websites of the first 100 chiropractors we could find to see how bad are their claims? How misleading are they? How frequent is it in this industry that people are misleading patients? And what we found was they were saying things that they're a doctor when they weren't a doctor. They said they could treat colic in babies. They can't. They said they could treat whiplash. They can't. There's no evidence. They are not allowed to say these things in advertising. And what we found was 82% eight, uh, of all chiropractors we found were making misleading claims, claims that did not pass advertising law and should not be made. So 82% of everyone we spoke to were making misleading claims. And then we thought, well, what about beyond the websites? What are they saying to people in person? What if we call up some chiropractors and ask them about some health concerns and see what they'll say? And so we, fought, we formed the 10 closest chiropractors to say, We've got this baby, and they're very unsettled. They have colic. There isn't a real treatment for colic, but we said that we have a baby who's got colic. Can you do anything about that? And chiropractors, by law, have to say no to that question. They're not allowed to claim to treat that. But actually, we found half of them said, yes, absolutely, bring the baby in. How young is the baby? Oh, no, there's no, you can't be too young. If it's a day old, bring your baby in. We have pregnant ladies come in uh, and have their babies adjusted before they're even born. We have day old babies come in. Now, you shouldn't be adjusting the spines of a day-old baby. You certainly shouldn't be doing that. There's no evidence, and there's a potential for harm there. But you certainly shouldn't be doing it for, for a treatment, uh, for a, a condition that there's no evidence it's going to help for. So this is a big issue for us. So we wrote to the, the uh, regulator of chiropractors and said, we've seen all of these complaints. What are you doing about it? Because it seems like you're not taking your job seriously. It's your job as given to you by the government. It's your legal duty. It doesn't seem like you're doing enough here. We think you should really actually book up your game and, uh, and, and regulate properly. And they said initially, they had a look at our complaints and threw them out. They didn't really investigate them. They said none of it was upheld. None of it really met the threshold for being harmful. But we said, well, if you're going to be like that, we're going to send you 25 complaints every single month for you to deal with. And so you're going to have to deal with those because it's your job. You have to actually look at them all. And that's what we did throughout 2016. They got 300 complaints in that time. They had 300 complaints. There's a lot of chiropractors to be dealing with. And in the end, they got so exasperated by how much work they had in trying to regulate properly, they met with us to share our concerns, and we spoke to them about it. And they actually published guidance to their members to say, this is what you need to do. You need to stop immediately saying the things that you were saying. It's not legal. You're not allowed to do that. But unfortunately, those complaints still dragged on. So 300 of those complaints were made. Even in summer of this year, 
the last of our complaints was still being dealt with, it was still being looked at, and it was closed and they haven't taken it fully seriously. So what they did do though was publish what they said were lessons learned. They said they've learned from this process. They said, it's unlikely that chiropractors are gonna come under less scrutiny. They meant us by that, we're gonna carry on scrutinizing them. But they have given guidance as to how to actually advertise properly. But the problem is they're not checking if anybody is following that guidance. And when they aren't following those guidance, they're not doing anything about it. They said they'd meet with us again to see what our concerns were and use us to help regulate and help make things better. But we've seen no indication of that. They haven't made any effort since uh, the last year to get in touch with us about it. None of their advertising con con uh, concerns have been fixed at all, really. They don't seem to be taking on board any of our concerns about safety. Our, our complaints weren't just about advertising. We're saying it's actually unsafe. Some of, the, mis some of the, the claims you're making are actually putting people in harm's way. They've ignored all of that. So we're actually going back to making complaints about them, uh, make, back to sort of reporting chiropractors to them, and show that we're not giving up on this. We're going to carry on scrutinizing them. We did exactly the same thing with osteopaths. I'll move through this quite quickly. So osteopaths are very similar to chiropractors. They operate in a slightly different way, but some of their modalities are based on the same kind of theories. They've got a regulator, the General Osteopathic Council, who've got exactly the same job to do as the chiropractic council. They're gonna make sure their members aren't making misleading claims that don't stand up to scrutiny, don't stand up to evidence. So we said, what if we looked at a sample of osteopaths' websites? How bad are they? Are they misleading too? Well, the ones we looked at, we found one in three websites weren't, uh, ma weren't making claims they could back up. So not as bad as chiropractors, but still were pretty bad. And then we found eight osteopaths to speak to and asked them, would you treat this baby who has colic? And what we found there was pretty much all of them would. The majority of them said, we will treat them, but the rest said, we won't, but someone else will. So even if their advertising was, was better, what they're saying to patients is just as dangerous. It's even more dangerous because they're all saying it. And some of them were saying, oh, you know, you can come in here and we can make sure your baby doesn't get colic. And you know that we don't actually vaccinate any kids because you can control all vaccinatable diseases just through osteopathy. So long as you bring your child in regularly, you don't need to vaccinate any children. None of the children here have had uh, any vaccines. So these are really dangerous, com dangerous claims for them to be making. So again, we told the, 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 the regulator, this isn't on. You've got a job to make sure people aren't harming people and you don't seem to be doing it. And they didn't really take us seriously initially. So we said, you're going to get 25 complaints a month. Every single month, we're going to send you 25 more names, 25 more claims that we've found that are not legal, and you have to do something about it. And they acted pretty sharp. So in September 2015, they issued guidance against all their members to say, don't do this stuff. You're not allowed to say these things. You've got to retract this. You're not allowed to make these misleading claims. And that's useful. They've pulled away, pulled away from uh, some of the things that their members were doing. And the advertising standards in the UK in 2016 also released their own thing saying you definitely can't make these things and strengthened that up to make it really clear what the law said. And this has had a bit of an effect. So initially, when we looked in 2015, there was one in three osteopaths who were making misleading claims. By the time we looked again in 2017, it was fewer. It was one in six. So we halved the number of misleading claims. Now, we don't know whether that's a trend that's going to continue or whether that one in six are just die hard going to make those claims. But we seem to be having an effect even on these industries that wouldn't listen to us normally and don't believe that skeptics are good people necessarily. And so... The last thing I'll talk about is uh, advertising. We've also worked with the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK, which is the, the body that makes sure you're not making misleading claims in adverts. And so we've, whenever we see misleading claims in adverts, particularly misleading health claims that we think are dangerous, we report them to that body, and the vast majority of the claims we, that we found have actually been upheld. All these green ones are ones where it's ruled in our favor and action's been taken against the advertiser and they've been told to stop making those claims. And there's a few that are still open, there are a few that are rejected. So we're starting to have an, an impact as well on the advertising. And this is something that, if there is an advertising watchdog in Bulgaria, this is a very useful thing that people could be doing. It takes very little time to highlight these claims to watch dogs and to point out why they're false uh, and it can actually have an effect as we've, uh, we've been having in the UK. And all of this stuff that we've been doing, we try as much as possible to play it out in the media. So when we see something we think is dangerous, we try and give this to a, a newspaper journalist to publish and talk about. And so for a very small organization where I'm the only full-time employee, we have another person working with us who's two days a week, on average we get mentioned in the UK national press every single week. That's our kind of coverage of, over the last few years. Last year, in, in the course of 52 weeks, we got 65 pieces of mainstream coverage in the national press. And this is all very useful because this all helps us cement in the public's understanding what skepticism is, 
what it means to check ideas, what critical thinking, what the value is, but also how dangerous some of the ideas that we're countering can actually be. These aren't harmless things. These are actually quite uh, important things. And because we've been able to forge good relationships with journalists, they now come to us as a source of interesting stories because we know how to package a story up so it has the hallmarks of an investigative, uh, investigative piece. So journalists come to us and say, what are you working on at the moment? Can we talk about it? When can we start publishing it? So it's a very useful place for us to be in feeding stories to newspapers and being able to get these kind of, uh, this public attention to it. And it's not just about sort of getting attention to our charity. It's demonstrating positive skeptical activism. It's demonstrating to the wider world that this is a change that can be made uh, and that there are things you, you can do to push back against the, the misleading claims that are all around us. Um, so that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, in summary, I think you can look at these organizations that are around you. There are mechanisms and regulators. By engaging with them and understanding how they work, you can start to push back and start to have uh, a real effect. And hopefully you'd agree that we've been having a real effect in the UK. Thank you. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. I realized I couldn't see the step. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I think that the work that you guys are doing is, uh, is inspirational. Oh, well, thank you so much, thank you. Yes, so the, you know, these are excellent results and I, and I, and I think we can learn a lot from you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully so. <laughs> right, right. It's very nice to say so. <laughs> now, I, I would like to start off the conversation with just you know, getting two of the questions out of, uh, out, of, out of the way, really. Let's go back to homeopathy. Mm. Can, you, can you like briefly describe what the classical theory of homeopathy is? Yeah, so there are sort of three rules to the classical theory of homeopathy. One is like cures like. So whatever is going to cause your symptoms will also cure your symptoms. So that might mean that uh, the homeopathic cure for hay fever, where it might mean that your eyes run, the homeopathic cure will be onion juice, because when you are cutting onions, it makes your eyes run. So they will take the onion juice and they'll use that as the cure for hay fever. But unfortunately, obviously, if you just have onion juice, it will make your eyes run. So the second rule comes in, which is that the more you dilute something, the stronger it gets. So the idea that Samuel Hahnemann just invented was that uh, you can keep the vibrational energy of the original substance, but you can get rid of all the negative effects by diluting it more and more and more. And so those are the, those are sort of the main two, actually, that, uh, that, that make the... That are what most homeopaths believe. So essentially, the more diluted a substance is, yeah. the stronger it is. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. very counterintuitive. It's, it, it doesn't make any it sense. Goes in, it, it flies in the face of everything we know about kind of chemistry. But also, right. if you talk to a child who knows how to, you know, knows orange squash, you know, they, they know that when you dilute stuff, it gets a lot less orangey. You, you want, uh, want less water in it. So it's very obvious to, to, to people when you explain it why that couldn't work. Right. Now, I understand that you had a chance to visit a factory where homeo 
homeopathic uh, medicine was made. So I, I didn't, but I know there's a, a really interesting report of the factory where the, most of the homeopathic medicine in the UK is made. Right. And so uh, this is Nelson's, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to, to export to the US. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, they had to get official seal of approval from, uh, from the US. And so someone from America came and looked at the factory and how it was being made. And so to make their homeopathic remedies, what Nelson's were doing is they were filling the little glass bottles with all the sugar pills, and they were doing all the dilution of the water, and then they were putting the sugar pills on a conveyor belt and shaking it, uh, because you need to shake the, the, the pills and shake the water to, in, to get the memory and the energy, the energy and vibrational energy to come through, apparently. Um, so these pills were shaking, and a single drop would come, and the dropper would put a single drop of the diluted liquid into the, the glass vial of pills, and that's how it would get, these blank sugar pills would get homeopathy on them. So the pills at the bottom would never see any of the liquid, but apparently it was fine because while they were shaking, the vibrational energy would transfer from the top pill to the bottom pill, and it was fine. The problem was, when the American uh, sort of review was going on, they noticed that because the pills were shaking and the dropper was coming along, on one occasion out of every six occasions, the drop missed the pills and landed on the conveyor belt. And the pills carried on shaking, never having seen any homeopathy, and nobody ever noticed that their pills didn't have any magic in them. So, N Now, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't it, wasn't it part of the classical theory of homeopathy that to activate the substance you need to use, like strike it like three times against oak surface? Or it it differs in different, uh, different sort of modalities, different ideas, but sometimes they say it needs to be against a surface that is hard yet giving, or firm yet giving. Sometimes they recommend a leather-bound book. Some recommend the Bible, because obviously, if you're gonna, you might as well, I guess, if you've got a leather-bound book. Spell, yes. um, so yeah, that's, that's one method. My favorite method, actually, of making homeopathy uh, is another one. It's the Corsacovian method. And so people looked at this. Uh, people would look at the, the normal way of doing it. You take a drop of water into 90, a drop of uh, onion juice into 99 drops of water and shake that. And take a drop of that into another 99 and shake that. And again and again and again. And that's the normal way of doing it. And that's a lot of water and a lot of glasses. And a guy came along uh, called, I think his name was uh, Semen Korsakov, uh, who said, well, surely there's a better way of doing it. Because if you take a glass filled with water and pour all the water out, when you turn the glass up again, there's bits of water sticking to the sides of the glass. He said, that's probably 1%. So to make homeopathy, you just need to get 99 drops of water, put a drop of onion juice in, shake it, pour it all away, fill it back up with water, shake it again, pour it all away again, and that's how the Corsacovian method of dilution works. I call that rinsing. You've just rinsed that glass very thoroughly. But that's how some, if you ever see a homeopathic remedy with a K on the back, that's how that was made, by rinsing out a glass. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now we got this out of the way, this absurdity. <laughs> uh, now, let's, let's talk a little bit about you know, convincing people. Um, now, most of us inhabit different social environments. Mm. You know, we have colleagues, I, I, I interact a lot with parents, you know, so it, it is inevitable that at some point somebody says, you know, hey, for this sore throat of yours, you know, use this, this homeopathic thing, you know. Yeah. Nothing helped me like this thing. Yeah. You know, and, and it's a very loaded and difficult conversation to have because you essentially have to question the legitimacy of a, of a personal experience of someone. Yes, yeah. You know, so, so it's a very difficult conversation to have. So, so how do you go about in having this, this type of conversation? What is the first question that you will ask such a person? Um, so I'm not sure about the first question. The first thing I would try and do is build a rapport with a person. Because I think the last thing that's useful is to tell them they're wrong fresh off the bat. You're completely wrong, it's total nonsense, here's what homeopathy is, you're an idiot. Once you start shouting at people or telling them they're idiots or condescending them, I think you're never going to persuade people. So the first thing that you can do is try and have a human conversation with them and say, well, tell me about, a bit about your homeopathy experience and try and get them talking about what they actually experienced. And from there you can say, okay, what would this look like if it wasn't the, homeop the homeopathy doing it? Is there anything that, may that you could, uh, any other way we could explain this? And if there is a way we can explain it, how do we know for certain it was that and not the homeopathy? How, how can we actually sort of distinguish between the two? Right. But I think you have to start, first of all, having the conversation and being sort of quite open about it. And the, and the other thing I, I like to do especially if you're uh, having a conversation with someone who's a real believer in homeopathy in front of anyone else, if there's anyone else listening who might be persuaded one way or another. One of the things to point out is to say, well, we have these individual stories. This person is absolutely sure it worked for them, 
but we've got to be more open-minded than individual stories, because what about the 999 people who tried it and it didn't work? They aren't going to be telling the story. So the way we look at it isn't to say, let's just look at what one person thinks. We try and look at 1,000 people, or 5,000 people, or 20,000 people, and the more individual stories we can collect together, the more we can tell where random chance happens. So we've got to be very open-minded when we hear someone's story to say, well, it might be that, but we don't know what else it could have been, so we have to keep our mind open. And if you can own that open-minded space before the homeopath does, it's quite a useful sort of gambit. Right. Uh, have you managed to actually convince someone who has you know, heavily invested in, in a certain belief, whether it's you know, homeopathy, flat earth, mm. trickle-down economics, whatever? <laughs> uh, have, have you managed to change someone's mind? Uh, I have, although it is rare. So, so one of the problems with uh, persuading people to doubt something they very passionately hold is that people don't like changing their mind. They don't like to feel their, their beliefs attacked. They don't like to, especially if those beliefs are in any way foundational or identities, part of who they, who they see themselves or a value. So if, you're, if they feel under attack, they will shut down. So the first step is not to attack them. Uh, the other thing is if you want to try and persuade someone to change their mind and you need them to admit to you they changed their mind, you're probably going to fail. If it's, I just want them to be able to doubt and, and, and sort of question and maybe come to a more rational position in the future, you might have a, a possibility of, of succeeding. If you, if you also need them to say, by the way, I was totally wrong and you were totally right, right. you're probably going to fail because people don't like to do that. But I have had some su success doing it. A colleague of mine was a 9-11 truther. And what I found was the, the way that I persuade people who, who are, are very passionate and are very persuaded by, by a certain idea, um, there's an analogy I like to use. If you look at, uh, imagine there's an asteroid going to hit the Earth. And if you look at the movies, what they say is, well, we just need to blow the asteroid up. Let's send up Bruce Willis with a bomb, blow that asteroid up. And in reality, if you did that, you've got loads of bits of asteroid hurtling towards Earth, and it's going to cause widespread devastation. And that's what happens if you tackle someone's belief head on. You cause this big explosion, you fall out with them, they no longer like you, there's shouting, but no one, nothing changes, nothing good happens. But if you talk to people, and I believe you've got people at ESA who could probably back this up, about how we actually would avoid an asteroid impact, is you spot the asteroids on a collision course with Earth, and you send something up that has a little bit of mass that's going to hang around near the asteroid, and slowly over time, the, the gravitational pull of that mass will change the path of that asteroid until, imperceptibly, it's no longer on a collision course. Right. And that's how you change people's minds. You hang around near them, you be in their lives, you have a rapport, you be the person that they love and respect, and you offer little challenges here and there. Nothing confrontational, nothing aggressive, nothing attacking, just little questions to ask themselves and let them think about those questions and then come back and ask again. And over time, you can get people to change their mind. And I did that with my colleague who was a 9-11 truther. And the only way I ever found out he changed his mind is because I heard him on the phone talking to another 9-11 truther about how wrong 9-11 truth movement was. And he was saying the things that we talked about, but he never said to me, I was wrong all those years right. because it's so hard to do that. He just quietly changed his mind in the corner and then got on with his life. And if that's enough for you, then you can have some success. Well, congratulations. It seems like you did the impossible. <laughs> I've tried many times, and I think it's a flaw of the method, as, uh, as, mm. as you described. Now, to take a step back um, um, about homeopathy. Now, I had this personal experience where, you know, my child was sick. So we went to a doctor. Uh, obviously, the kid, uh, you know, he just had a, a cold, you know, yeah. a common cold. Um, but just in case, we went. And uh, what the doctor did is she described, uh, she prescribed homeopathy. Mm. And then I confronted her. I said, you know, is that the homeopath uh, homeopathic? Medicine. And she said, yes. And I said, okay, I, don't, I do not believe in that. You know, so, yeah. you know, if you could please you know, prescribe something else. And she was relieved. You know, and she, she, really? she was like, oh, my God, thank you very much. You know, it's like, yes, I will gladly you know, explain. You know, and the common cold is not something that we can actually cure. We can mm. just you know, uh, uh, relieve the symptoms a little bit. Uh, but what she said is, uh, is, is very interesting. You know, like people need to have the comfort of, of being prescribed something that they believe will work. You know, telling them that there is no medicine for the common cold is not something that works. So my question is, do you believe that there is certain value in prescribing sugar pills in certain situations just to come to comfort yeah. your parents? So, so this comes up quite a lot when I talk about homeopathy, and I think there's several reasons that I, that I would disagree with it. Um, one of the reasons being sort of the, the way that modern medicine typically goes now is it's a lot more collaborative than the old style, doctor knows best, you right. never question the doctor. That led to some very dangerous things that we, we need to avoid going down in, in the future. So we have patient, uh, patient consent and informed consent. And I think you fundamentally can't have informed consent if one 
part of that information is being withheld. If the doctor isn't saying, do you want to take this? It doesn't work, but you might feel better. Right. You know, because you're going to get better anyway. If you're not going to say that, then you're withholding some information, and the very notion of, of informed consent kind of goes away a little bit. Um, but I also think there's a... a, a, a a difficult thing when it comes to the legitimacy that it affords sugar pills by being prescribed by doctors. And so we have this in the, in the, in, with the NHS. The NHS wasn't giving sugar pills for serious things. It wasn't giving it to cancer patients right. you know, or for, for anything really serious. It was for self-limiting conditions, so things that are going to get better by themselves, where there's not a really good treatment anyway, or you've tried several different treatments, and none of the ones that work for most people happen to work for you. And one of the things was migraines. So if you had a migraine, they'd send you to see the homeopath sometimes because there isn't a very, a very good treatment for a, a migraine and you just have to wait for it to pass. But one of the problems is if you had a migraine and went to see the NHS-approved homeopath and your migraine goes away because migraines go away, you might think, well, that homeopathy definitely worked. And the next time you get a migraine, you might think, well, do I want to go and see my doctor and wait to get an appointment and wait to be referred to a homeopath and go through all of that process? Or should I just go and see the homeopath on the street down the, around yeah. the corner? And when you're, when you're seeing that homeopath, and you mention that you've just had a baby, and, you, and that homeopath says, well, you know, you don't need to vaccinate because we've got our own homeopathic vaccines, right. you're more likely to trust that homeopath because your doctor sent you to a homeopath. Yes. So I think that there has to be a real distance from, between uh, proven medical treatments and treatments for which there is reasonably good evidence, the best available evidence says that it works, there has to be a distance between that and the things that we know don't work that might be prescribed because they're convenient um, to, to people. Uh, I, I think there also has to be a thing around tra retraining people not to expect pills every time. So yeah. this comes up a lot with the veterinary homeopathy. One of the reasons a lot of vets give homeopathy who, who don't even believe that homeopathy works is because if they, don't, if they didn't give homeopathy, the uh, owner of the animal would demand anti antibiotics, right. which have been routinely overprescribed because they're used to getting pills. You see the vet, vet gives you a pill. If you see the vet and they don't give you a pill, you feel shortchanged. Yes. If that vet was saying, actually, here's all the reasons I'm not going to give you a pill right now, and I can see, here's all the reasons that, you know, I can see the, the animal's symptoms, and I can see why a pill wouldn't be appropriate, here's why these pills wouldn't be appropriate, here's why these ones wouldn't be appropriate, here's how you can actually help your animal through lifestyle interventions and diet and exercise and the various things that our doctors tell us as well. That time to educate the people so they would, would give them the feeling that the, the experience they've had with the vet was still valuable, even though they don't have something in their hand at the end of it. Right, and I right. think that's what we need to get, get towards, is, is having people have that kind of collaboration. It, it's interesting that you mentioned experience, because um, what separates homeopathy, or, or rather the, the doctors that are homeopaths, mm. doctors, um, is exactly the experience that people have when visiting their offices. You know, they spend much more time with you. Yeah. Uh, um, they, they take the time to explain what is happening and what will eventually happen. They just pay more attention to you. Mm. You know, and, and that is one of the one of the reasons why people consistently consistently you know keep visiting these people because of, of the very experience that they get. You know, they get attention. Yeah, you know, yeah. Whereas people in uh, like doctors in public hospitals, they you just you know just get on my office, there are 50 people waiting. Yeah, and in a way it's because homeopaths and, and people who are doing alternative medicine have the luxury of having fewer people to see yes. because uh, they, what they're doing isn't you know, state-sponsored, hopefully, in most places. Uh, what they're doing isn't, uh, isn't proven to work and therefore they have a, a, a duty to see as many people as possible to help as many people yes. as possible. You, know, you go and see a doctor, the reason the waiting room is full is because what the doctor does typically works and that's why people go there. Uh, the, the, the waiting rooms in homeopaths are going to be smaller because they're convincing, like people are convinced that it works, right. but they aren't treating as many people because there is no good evidence that it works. But um, one of the things we did when we were in the public consultations about homeopathy in, in, uh, in Liverpool, where I live, is they had an open consultation for public to come in to talk about whether what they think should happen with homeopathy. And so there were patients there who uh, believe that homeopathy works, who've been told by their doctors, their homeopaths, that they should take homeopathy. And I spoke to one of the patients, and I, and I don't know what, she, what her uh, ailment was, and it probably, I, would, I didn't ask, I didn't think it was appropriate to ask. But what she said was, um, I had this very painful condition, and I saw a doctor, and they just gave me a pill. And that pill didn't work, so I went back to the doctor, and they gave me another pill. And that didn't work, and, I, and she said, I went through so many pills that I felt they were just experimenting on me. And then I, she said, I saw a homeopath, and they talked, and they listened. And after a while, we came to an agreement that I would try this remedy. 
And when that remedy didn't work, I went back to the homeopath and we discussed why it didn't work and we came up with a new remedy to work. And that remedy didn't work. And so we tried a new one. But she was very positive about the homeopath and very negative about the doctor. Right. When if you step back, those, those scenarios are the same. You tried a thing, it didn't work. You tried the next thing, you tried the next thing. Now the doctor, what they were doing was, if I say 100 people with your condition, 50 of them will get better if I give them this thing. So I'm gonna hope you're one of those 50. You weren't one of those 50. Well, of the 50 people who aren't better yet, if I give them this one, another 30 will get better. You weren't one of those ones. Eventually, you're gonna make your way through the filters that someone becomes the 99th, the 100th person that there isn't a, treat a very good effective treatment for. Um, and they will feel that they've just been given sort of very little uh, attention from doctors, but what they get from the homeopath is the same experience, but with a lot more softer touches around it, a lot more time, because the homeopath has time. Right, right. Right, um, let's talk about skepticism. Mm. A little bit. Um, what are skeptical organizations for? I mean, what is your mission statement? And what is the type of society that you would like to see as a result of your work? Um, I think where we come in is it's kind of the, the crossover between um, scientific communication and consumer protection. For me, I'm not here to try and ban various different things from existing. Um, I don't think they should be public funded. And if there's public money going on those then I think that should stop, and that's one of the things we'll try and campaign for. Um, I'd like to, to get to a place where the public are educated enough and aware enough and are given enough of the information. Most people, when they're given enough information, will generally understand it, um, that they make the right choices, but I'm not there to prescribe their choices. Because I think the important thing is, if you're in a, in a crisis, and it might be a health crisis, it might be grief, I mean, you know, we do a lot of work when it comes to people who believe in psychics, a lot of those people who, who go to see a psychic are experiencing grief. If you're going through a health crisis, you might be experiencing uh, a, a lot of kind of upheaval in your life, a lot of uh, negative kind of associations to that, and you aren't gonna be in the best position to make good informed choices, and I think that's what skeptics are for, is to help people who are in a position where they might not be able to make the best uh, choices based on the best available evidence because they've got a, a bias from their conditions. And the reason we should be doing that is because we're all just as vulnerable to it. I could have a crisis tomorrow, and I don't know that I'd be in a strong enough position to reject the things that my friends would look at and say, obviously that's not true, because those, those emotional drivers are so powerful for all of us. So I think skepticism is a way of watching each other's back, and if we're all watching each other's back, nobody gets stabbed, <laughs> kind of thing, nobody gets harmed. And that's what I think, uh, that's the society I'd like to th see through skepticism, that we're all trying to limit the, the ways in which people can be misled, and limit the ways in which people who want to mislead are allowed to do so and, and have the space to operate. Right. Now, now here in Ratio, we are not um, a skeptical organization per se. You know, mm. What we are trying to do is uh, disseminate scientific knowledge and uh, you know, hopefully people will pick up the scientific method and use it in their daily lives. Mm. Uh, when we talk about skeptical organizations in general though, not specifically about yours, you know, mm. if we just look around you know, the different groups that are currently operating, uh, it seems like you know, skeptical groups are defined by their opposition to something. Yeah. Uh, you know, they are against this, against that. You know, they talk about them, the people, they who believe, you know, these stupid mm. things. You know. um, so my feeling is that, that this creates, you know, more division and, and, and tribalism and, you know, negativism. Mm. You know, it's, it's like you have the second law of Newton, you know, they, they, yeah, they, they yeah. react. So what are your thoughts about that? That you know, I'm essentially asking you to comment on your on your colleagues. <laughs> I'm very happy to comment on my colleagues. That's fine. Yeah. No, no. Um, I would say, I, I think what's often missing from a lot of skeptical, uh, from the design of some skeptical organisations, or, or from how people see their skeptical activism, is an idea of compassion. And for me, that has to be first and foremost that we're doing this not because we just want to be right. And therefore, because we're right, we're better than everyone. We aren't better than everyone. Just because you've got the right answer about a thing, it doesn't make you better. It just make, means that you have access to that information at that time. Um, for me, it's all about helping people uh, become more aware of things uh, and, and seeing uh, the, the place of skepticism as, as being sort of compassionate for the people who are being misled and to try and limit that. So, so I guess we are still defining ourselves by opposition, but I, I also think we try and define ourselves by the help we try and give as much as the, the correction we try to do. We're there to try and help people. And I think we can sometimes, we, some types of skeptical activism, 
they feel very good is to say, oh, this is wrong, these people are idiots, this is all ridiculous. And it can feel quite uh, emboldening to say that because a lot of people in our community would have gone through a long time where they're the only person in the room saying that and all their friends might believe or not care either way. So it can feel quite, uh, quite uh, invigorating to find a community of people who agree that these ideas are wrong. And you can get sort of trapped in that, I kind of define it as kind of skeptical adolescence. It's kind of like, I've learned about this, I want to tell everyone how wrong they are and how right I am. Yeah. You know, I'm now a skeptic, point me at things and I'll be right about it. It. Um, and I think that's a wrong style of skepticism. I think if you really want to try and change things, you sort of have to try and progress to a more compassionate view of the world to say, well, now that we have this information, it's kind of a duty of ours to try and spread it. It's a duty of ours to try and protect people from the people out there who are misleading people. Um, and also, we shouldn't cede the idea of compassion and empathy to the people we disagree with. So often, the reason people will say they like their psychic or they like their alternative therapist is because they listen and because they seem so approachable and warm and friendly. And there is nothing stopping us being approachable, warm and friendly, as well as being right. We don't have to be right and then stop there. We can say, well, how do we package up the, the, the answers we have that we think are right to make them as palatable as possible, as approachable as possible, as broad as possible, to get as many people as involved as possible. And that's the kind of thing I try and do is spread compassionate critical thinking, I guess. Right. So. What we're also trying to do here, essentially, is, is to change the type of conversation that we are, that we are having. Mm. And now, uh, you know, as we, you know, going back to, uh, to, to the method, you know, and, 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 and to how to convince, you know, different people, we're not going to, like we say in Bulgaria, you know, suddenly discover hot water, you know. Uh, you know, Socrates, uh, you know, developed the method of questioning, you mm. know, whose, you know, single purpose was to, you know, question the origin of the beliefs of, of someone, you know, um, uh, you know, find the logical fallacies, you know, find the common ground, uncover the truth, whilst, you know, protecting the dignity of, uh, of, of this person, mm. you know, without the use of any adjectives. Um, so do you think that, and I, and I think you, you already sort of answered this question, but do, do you think that skeptical organizations need to change their vocabulary? Because what we have is if we think of the most popular, you know, skeptics in the world right mm. now, you know, part of the reason that we like them is exactly because of the language that they use. But at the same time, by looking at the effectiveness of their message, it's, it's very questionable. Yeah, so I, I'm not here to tell people how to do their skepticism. That's right. one thing I'd never want to do. Um, and I think it is a a broad movement that can uh, accommodate people who've got lots of different outlooks. And there are some people who will be the firebrands who say, all these people are idiots, all these, people, all these things are wrong, and they will attract a lot of attention, they'll attract a lot of people. And I would hope that those, a lot of the people who get attracted by that would progress through what I would still consider to be a skeptical adolescence, a skeptical sort of teenage years kind of thing, right. into the more sort of responsible look around the world and how to make it a bit better uh, and be more positive about it kind of way. So I think there are some people who will gather quite a large audience, and that's not necessarily a bad thing if we can use some of that audience to, to sort of convert people, for want of a better word, to a more sort of uh, empathetic form of skepticism. Um, I do think it's important to change the way we talk about things a bit. So one of the things I try and look at is the people we disagree with, what are their values? What are they trying to achieve? Because we can paint them as evil. We can talk about anti-vaxxers and you'll see memes shared on social media. Uh, I saw one the other day, it was how do you talk to an anti-vaxxer's child? And it was a picture of a Ouija board. And it was shared thousands, tens of thousands of times. And I thought, you know, that, people will find that as pretty funny and I can see where the joke is. But if you're an anti-vaxxer and you see that, what vision of skepticism do you get? If yeah. you've been told skeptics are these evil people who want to put your children in harm's way, and you see that meme, does that change your mind? Does that cement it? Mm. And I think instead, when it comes to anti-vax, and it's so hard because anti-vax is such a dangerous position and it's harming so many children that our visceral response to it is entirely understandable. Right. But I think if we want to try and be effective, we've got to take that visceral response and redirect it to a more useful form of communication. And so what I would say when I, t when I talk to people, as I do for a podcast that I have called uh, Be Reasonable, when I talk to people who are anti-vax, what I try to do is understand what are their motivations. Well, their motivations are probably they want to protect children. I think they're wrong about how they want to protect it. Evidence says they're wrong about the way that they're going about protecting their children. But they aren't trying to harm their children. They're trying to protect it. So protect their child. So you can actually get somewhere, I think, if you, say, if you then start a conversation based around those values to say, I understand you're trying to protect your children. I can see that's your motivation. 
my motivation is also protecting children. I can explain to you five different ways that I'm really keen on making sure children are protected. So if we agree that protecting children is what we both want to do, we can divorce that from the act of vaccination right. and look at the vaccination separately. It's no longer loaded through all the values and ideology and, and identity. If you can take that away and say, we're both on the same page as what we want to try and achieve, yeah. so what method can we use to achieve that? I think those are the techni techniques I'd rather have with people we disagree with than say, if you're anti-vax, you are a child killer and I don't want to hear from you. Well, if you don't want to hear from them, you're not going to change their mind and they're going to carry on, in your words, killing children. You're not going right. to affect that. Right. Yeah, because it's, it, it does seem to be that um, we, you know, skeptical people in general, you know, we are very loud, you know, very often we're eloquent, but it seems to me like most of the time we're speaking by ourselves. You know, mm. we have kind of lost, you know, the art of, uh, of, of listening. Mm. You know, and unless we take the path and, and try to understand where this person is coming from, uh, you know, what are his beliefs and, you know, put ourselves in their shoes, how are we going to convince them that it's worth it that they walk with us as well? You yeah, know, for, yeah. Uh, for a while, you know? Also, you won't understand them. So one of the things that I've, I've been doing, and I mentioned it at the start of the talk, ever since I've been involved in skepticism, I've been going to alternative health meetings. I've been going to mind, body, spirit festivals and having people explain to me as a, as a regular ticket-paying attendee, what it is yes. that they do. So I can understand when they're convincing people, what are they saying? I've heard it, so I now understand this a little bit. So when I'm talking to people who are convinced, I've heard the sales pitch already. And it's similar when I talk, uh, I spent a long time over the last couple of years speaking with flat earthers, and I do a whole talk about the, the flat earth movement. And one of the things I found from talking to flat earthers is that they all disagree with what the world looks like. And if you talk to a flat earther and you want to persuade them that the world is actually round and not flat, if you don't first understand what model they've got in their head, you're going to be useless because you're going to, t you're going to bring up proofs that don't fit what they're thinking. So you have to first understand what people think and then look for challenges, look for places where you can introduce ideas. And instead of saying, you're wrong about this, you say things like, I'm trying to follow you, but when I follow you, I hit this problem. How do you get past that problem? Can you help me understand this issue? People want to talk to you. If they, if they have a rapport, people want to talk to you about what they believe. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to fight back against a challenge. But if you say, could you tell me how, what you believed? Explain to me what you think. Tell me more about these ideas. People want to do that. And it's, so, it's given them the space to do that. And yeah. then using that space, using that rapport and that momentum to then get them to take a, a turn that they might not have thought about before and see where they, see where they end up. Right. And, and most importantly, you know, not to be condescending and not necessarily you know, to try to, to make them make this turn. You know, mm. it could be just an exercise of you yourself learning something from these. Yeah, people. yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not, um, it's weird. Um, okay, let's talk about public policy then. Uh, you know, obviously you, you managed to affect legislation and you had, uh, you know, quite a lot um, of dealing to do with, uh, with government. So I'm curious on your view of what the role of government should be or, or rather, do you think that governments should be more paternalistic uh, in their policies, meaning that, that they don't necessarily uh, follow the democratic principle of reflecting the views of the majority, mm. but rather legislate on the basis of uh, principles like you know, scientific fact and et cetera, et cetera, meaning that uh, do you think that governments need to be less political and, and, and more technocratic? In that sense? Um, God, it's a really interesting question. So I would say I, I'd instinctively avoid uh, endorsing the idea of uh, having a, a paternalistic organization if that organization uh, was prescriptive. If it was, uh, these ideas are banned, so you don't ever learn anything about them, they're just off limits, and so no, no one will ever be able to do it, but no one will ever be able to learn from why these ideas aren't good. I think it's really important. Pseudoscience is, a, is actually a great tool for teaching uh, science, uh, the scientific method and how we understood, uh, understand stuff. It's also a great tool for teaching introspection and how you evaluate your own beliefs and, and, and the things you believe in, whether they, they are, whether they do stack up, whether you can justify them. So I think it, it's not about banning these things in that kind of sense. But I, I don't think a government should just... The NHS used to have a homeopath on its board, and as a result, we spent millions of pounds on homeopathy every year, despite what the evidence says. I think it's, an, it's, if it's incumbent on organizations like government organizations, where they're representing people, to represent people in the best way possible, and that means following good, good available evidence, following right. the best available evidence. So the NHS shouldn't be, in the UK, shouldn't be funding things that there's no good evidence that they work, or there's good evidence that they don't work. Um, even if they got a petition of 50,000 homeopaths saying, you should carry on funding this, 
it's not a, you shouldn't be making these decisions, in my opinion, based on popularity, but based on the evidence. But again, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case that homeopathy is completely banned in the UK right. because the government says it doesn't work, therefore no one's allowed to know anything about it, no one's allowed to learn it, no one's allowed to do it, because that just leads people to be uh, following what they're told and doesn't develop that level of criticality that becomes really useful the next time you come across something the government hasn't found out about yet yes. and hasn't had time to ban yet. Yes. Well, obviously, that was an arbitrary question. You know, now in a few months, English will cease to be an official language of the European Union. So we, uh, we, yeah. we saw a reflection of the same thing, you know, that uh, a political decision wasn't made based on, you know, sound evidence, mm. you know, science, economic statistics, whatever, uh, but was, you know, due to following a democratic democratic principle. But yeah. it, is, it is a rather complicated topic, so let, let, let's just not <laughs> deep dive into it. Um, a slightly more radical question then. Do you think that government should legislate speech that you know, dissemi disseminates or promotes pseudoscientific beliefs? Uh, yeah, that's a really tough one. And the free speech issue is one that's, that's quite large in, uh, in the UK and, and certainly in America right now. And, and often when it comes up in the UK and in America, I think it's actually a bit of a red herring um, in that a, a lot of the... A lot of the speech that's being talked about is, is specifically extremist and specifically extremist in one angle uh, in order to sort of help spread that, that kind of, uh, right. that, those kind of ideas a lot more. There's, there's universities in the UK who are bringing on extremely, uh, extreme right-wing uh, figures because they believe in free speech. Now, those same groups aren't bringing extreme left-wing figures in, yeah. so clearly there's only one type of free speech is very important there, and it's because they're being provoked by certain organizations. Um, I'm, I'm not one to, to back the, the banning of speech generally. I think there are some things that are beyond the pale, um, and, and you can probably imagine the kind of things that, that I mean by that, but I don't think pseudoscience would go into that category. Partly, again, because I don't want to ban it. I don't want to ban all pseudoscience or ban the pseudosciences we know about and therefore bring up a, a, you know, engender a population with no ability to think critically about these, these ideas themselves. Right. It, it comes up quite often when it talks about education at school. People say, would you want schools to uh, teach critical thinking and to tell children that homeopathy... Yes, I want. Yes, I think your mic just went down. Can you, let me just grab this one. Sorry, this happens quite mm -hmm. often. There you go. Hope that um, works. Are we okay? Yeah, brilliant. Um, so yeah, I'd say yes, I'd like schools to teach critical thinking, but no, I wouldn't want schools to tell children that homeopathy doesn't work because what I don't want is an entire generation of school children who learn enough to walk past the homeopath saying, ha, 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 that doesn't work, and they work, walk in the next building, which is a chiropractor or an osteopath or a Scientologist right. or another form of pseudoscience because they've not been taught the tools of how to evaluate these things. So I think learning about pseudoscience is, is important. Um, because it helps us evaluate them. And I think some of the collateral of that will be that people will believe it. And then some of the collateral of that will mean it needs organizations like us to try and help people see why it shouldn't be believed. But I'm not a, a, I'm not a proponent of banning it outright. Right. So uh, at the end of our conversation, let's talk about these tools. Now, I have a, I have a kid. You know, I do my best you know, to, to try to you know, raise him as a skeptical, a skeptical person. Now, what would your advice be, both for a mind that is currently unraveling, you know, expanding, mm. uh, and for a person who already has his mind settled. Advice on just anything? Uh, how to develop these, you know, important faculties, you know, of, 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 of critical thinking. You know, what would your approach be if you want to teach your grandma <laughs> and your kid? Um, I think one of the, the main things I would always encourage is for people to look, look to sources they disagree with, look for ideas they disagree with. And, and evaluate those ideas as freshly as possible. Um, I think that's always a useful thing. It, it, it prevents people getting into this idea of, uh, I already believe in this, and therefore I'm only gonna find stuff that already agrees with me to, to sort of solidify that idea. Right. I think holding that idea that, uh, that ideas are provisional, that how effective ideas are have to remain provisional, but provisional still means a lot of the time you'll assume they work. You know, yes. You'll have a lot of people who will say, well, you know, how can we know anything? We don't know that we're even alive right now, but those people still look both ways when they cross the road yes. because they do believe they're alive right now and they do believe there is an external reality that will hit them at 60 miles an hour if they aren't looking. Right. Um, so I think believing that ideas are provisional is useful as far as that, as that goes, but also seeking out ideas you dis disagree with and trying to understand 
if you still disagree with them, why do you disagree with them? And do your, do your disagreements hold by exposing them to as much sort of light as possible? I think that's what I would try and do. Now, whether you do, the way to which you do that with children uh, is obviously going to be quite tricky because they haven't got very well-formed ideas already. And the last thing you want to do is expose your child to so much nonsense that they start yes. to believe it. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure on that. And I, I don't have children, so it's a, not a, a problem I have to face, fortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah. What I, what, what, what I find to be very useful is, you know, you j just ask a simple question, you know, it's like, uh, I, I tell him, hey, I have an elephant in my back pocket. No, you don't. You know, how do you, how do you know I yeah, don't? You yeah. know, and they just start thinking, you know, so I think that human beings are very good intuitive skeptics. Mm -hmm. You know, what it, I think what it takes is that people, and most, I, I think all people, you know, use critical thinking in their daily life. Oh, yeah, yeah. They absolutely. just don't use it in all the spheres of yeah, their Yeah, they don't life. use it consistently. Yeah, yeah. So, so they just have to take, you know, what they naturally are good at and just apply it in, 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 different, in different situations. Yeah, I, I think that's true. So when I introduce skepticism, when I, when I introduce our events, the way that I talk to new people about what skepticism is, is that if you're going to buy a second-hand car, the person selling you the car says, this is a brilliant car, it's a wonderful car, best car you'll ever have. But you don't just believe them. You kick the tires. You take it for a test drive. Yeah. Uh, and we need to be doing the, that test driving of ideas with all the things we believe. And if there are things we believe most passionately, those are the things we need to test drive uh, most vigorously because they're the ones yes. we're, we're least likely to be able to see the flaws in. So yeah, that kind of questioning and checking our own ideas is, is, is vital. Right. Now, Michael, I think that this is our first event since we've been doing this for seven years where I, when we didn't have a single question being submitted. Oh really? No, oh. I, I, I take this as a as a positive. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I think the people were just were, were just listening carefully both your presentation and the and the conversation yeah. that we had. I've, I've answered everything you might possibly want to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you very much both for the for the work that you are doing. I think it's extremely important and 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 it is a excellent blueprint of you know how civil society should actually should actually work. Thank so. You. Uh, Thank you very much for this, uh, for this work and, and thank you very much for your participation and, and the nice conversation that we have. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks a lot. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Michael. <clears throat> Actually, <laughs> we have had a technical issue. Ah. So the, 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 the problem was with, uh, obviously, my device. Apparently, there are hundreds of questions. <laughs> so I do apologize about that. Now, we, we are sort of out of time. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, try to make this work in the, next, in the next five minutes so we can ask at least a couple of questions. Uh, anyways, I'm going to send those to you. So you can do the labor. <laughs> oh, okay, to okay, each yes, one yeah. Of the people. So I do apologize about that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry for this technical, okay. for this technical glitch. Uh, but we do have to wrap this, uh, uh, to wrap this event up. Um, okay, I'm going to switch to Bulgarian now, Michael, if you don't mind. Добре, преди да се преди да се разделим отново, поднасям извинения за за тази техническа глупост, която тук ще се случи. Apple. Така, така преди, да се, преди да се разделим, а, ми се ще да ви покажем кои ще са следващите евенти, които ще се случват. Най-близкото нещо, което предстои съвсем скоро, и това е на 17, точно, точно след 10 дена, а, е една, едно фантастично събитие, което а, цели да ни разкаже за странните психологически състояния, на които хората, в които хората и, изпадат. А, това ще е един ток и разговор за, за така невероятната палитра на човешкото състояние за всички негови проявления. От хора, които така, вярват, така, искрено искат да си отрежат кръка, тъй като го чувстват като чуждо тяло, а, до хора, които а, чувстват, че са така, отвлечени от извънземни а, и прочие, и прочие, и прочие най, най, най-различни прояви на човешкия тум. А, Брайан Шарплес а, ще идва за втори път а, при нас. Uh, първия път беше, беше наистина, наистина страхотно, така че ви съветвам uh, да дойдете. Събитието ще се проведе в Мозейко, Мозейко за големи се нарича събитието, с тях uh, си кооперираме доста добре. Uh, така че заповядайте на 17.9, ако не се лъжа uh, и тук да ме поправят от организацията, трябват билети за, uh, за този ивент. Да, така че купете си, купете си билети на Рацио БГ.
Продължаваме нататък, какво имаме след това. Така, квантови компютри. Деян Стефанов, мисля, че се казваше нашият, нашият лектор. Един... Михайлов, благодаря. Да. Днеска съм във форма. Деян Михайлов е един блестящ български учен. Наскоро беше, така още, той преди, преди също, също, ни, също ни е гостувал за една друга тема. Като той отрича този, този безспорен факт, но той е, може би, най-младият лектор по физика в, в Оксфорд в момента. Изключително брилянтен човек, който си заслужава да изследително да чуете и да видите. Темата ще е квантови компютри в клуб Карусел на 27 септември. Това е безплатен евент, ако не се лъжа. Така продължаваме нататък. Така, а, така ние отраци имаме една а, страхотна новина, не знам доколко ми е разрешено да я споделя, но така, хората от организацията нямат контрол над мен а, директен в момента, така че might as well. А, това, което успяхме да постигнем като организация през последните няколко месеца е да влезем в едно така, по-формално и официално сътрудничество с Европейската космическа агенция, а, като ние, да, това е страхотно. Мисля, че сме първата, първата организация в България, която е успяла да постигне, да постигне нещо подобно, като а, така ние влизаме в едно а, така съучастие с тях, а, за да се впуснем в така благородното дело да популяризираме науката. А, и в рамките на това сътрудничество решихме, че октомври месец ще е нашият Space, Space Month. През целият октомври, мисля, че имаме организираме точно, казвам много мисля, трябва да се подготвям по-добре. Имаме четири събития, а, които ще са на различна космическа тематика, като три, благодаря, така, а, мисля, че имаме визия за първото, за първото събитие през, през октомври. Не, това е визията за рацио. Добре, нямаме визия в момента, а, за да видите какво ще се случва през Space Month, а, така, Плесте във Фейсбук, абонирайте се за нашия News Letter, ли се нарича, вече съм стар. А, там ще получите своевременна информация за това какви ще са темите и какви ще са гостите. А, това сътрудничество в Европейската космическа агенция ни, ни дава достъп до, до изключителни хора, които със сигурност си заслужават да, да чуете и да видите. Та, това ще се случва през октомври и разбира се на 10 ноември предстои голямото събитие, рацио 2019 есен. Колко от вас са били на голямо рацио? Никога не сте стъпвали. Добре, не всички. А, това а, събитие е нашата голяма гордост. Стараем се да провеждаме два пъти годишно а, голям рацио евент, като това е едно целодневно събитие, което започва в 10.30 и продължава до 5.30. Като а, формата е малко по-различен, а, обикновено имаме три а, големи, а, големи лекции а, от наистина изявени учени и оратори. А, Стараем се а, темите да са, да, са, да са максимално различни, разбира се, те са в лоното на науката. А, имаме обикновено един дискусионен панел, а, после завършваме с Q&A сесия, събитието се провежда в София Event Center. А, мястото е изключително, изключително готино, обикновено се събират около хиляда човека, имаме безплатна бира, безплатна храна, а, най-различни научни демонстрации, имаме мърч за хората, които искат тениски и, и неща да си купуват. А, билетите свършват много бързо, мисля, че нашите Early Bird билети вече са изчерпани, а, така че ви призовавам да си купите билети от сега, защото не са останали много. Според мен наистина се заслужава да го видите поне, поне веднъж. Такова нещо не се прави в, в България, смея да заявя. Така. <към> сега абстрахирайте се, абстрахирайте се от моя перформанс днес. А, <към> да поне съм хубав. На, за съжаление, това няма да помага за това, което ще кажа след малко. Рацио подкаст, как се казваше това? В смисъл, Борева и Get Your Podcast, който от вас слуша подкасти. Ако, ако вие харесвате, ако на вас ви харесва да слушате подобни форми на дискусии, каквато имахме току-що с, с нашия гост, или просто разговори на различни, на различни научни теми с различни хора, аз и Любо, който вероятно е познат на, на някой от вас, за съжаление, да, е познат на немалко от вас. Се стараем да, да работим и по този, и по този формат. Малко са хитен мис нещата, но се учим, учим се в движение, все пак нямаме така формална радиоподготовка. Но мисля, че, но мисля, че се получава добре. Чуйте го и се абонирайте за Рацио Подкаст, може да научите много интересни неща там и да чуете немалко глупости, между другото. Така, от съвсем скоро 
Имаме и Patreon аккаунт, не знам колко от вас знаят за Patreon и, и каква е тази платформа. Това е така съвременния начин хората, хора като вас, меценати, любители на изкуството, културата и науката, да могат, ако решат и най-вече ако имат възможност, да подкрепят организации като нашата, които са си така, поставили нелеката задача да популяризират науката в България. Имайте предвид, работим, ние сме мисля, че около 50, вече 60 човека доброволци, имаме само един човек на пейчек за сега. А, така че всяко, всяко едно от нещата, които правим, изисква изключително много усилия, очевидно изисква и средства, така че всяко, всяка помощ, която може да дойде в наша посока, ще ни бъде от полза. А, тук сега съм задължен да прочета имената с най-голямо удоволствие, ще го направя на хората, които а, така са се абонирали за Patreon и, и, и ежемесечно правят дарения към нас. Това са Ценер който не си дава истинското име, Надка, имаме Димитър Цънков, Димитров, Свилен Спасов и Александър Лазаров. Почерпете ни една бира, винаги ще бъде полезно. <към> имаме ли още нещо за казване? Мисля, че това беше. Добре, е, разбира се, следвайте ни в, в, в Facebook, все още нямаме Instagram, най-вероятно няма и да имаме няма, ня, няма много какво да показваме там, но следвайте ни във Фейсбук, там ще виждате апдейти за нашите събития, както и ще може ежедневно или поне през няколко дни да получавате интересни новини от областта на науката. Дами и господа, това беше всичко от нас за тази вечер. Надявам се, че ви е било приятно. Изпийте по една бира, поговорете си и ви желая хубава вечер. Мерси много!